Ladies and gentlemen, good morning from Vienna. I welcome you to the seventh Prag Process webinar taking place uh, with Monica Alfaro today. We are glad to have as many of you from so many countries present with us today. Before introducing our team and the speaker, let me remind you of some technical features of this Zoom platform. Please choose your preferred language, English or Russian, uh, through the interpretation button on your screen. You can use the chat function for asking questions throughout the webinar. And this webinar will be recorded in order to then also upload it to the Prague Process website. We will share the presentation of today's speaker with you following the event and the recording will also be freely accessible to any interested uh, users. With this being said, I'm very happy to have my team here. We have Irina Lusak, a project officer within the Prague Process Secretariat at ICMPD, who will be guiding us through the Q&A session, and Julia Subotska, our project assistant, who set up the meeting. I would also like to thank Basis Production for supporting us in carrying out these webinars through their technical, but also interpretation uh, services. And um, I would maybe just say a few words about the webinar series. My name, by the way, is Alexander Malev. I'm project manager within the Prague Process Secretariat at ICMPD in Vienna. Uh, the International Center for Migration Policy Development is an international organization featuring 18 participating states. The Prague Process is an intergovernmental migration dialogue featuring 50 participating states. And we're very glad that our contingency plan, which resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic, has been received uh, positively by our participating states and that we are today already carrying out our seventh webinar. Today's webinar focuses on the EU framework for legal migration, lessons learned and main challenges. These findings uh, actually stem from the fitness check of the EU legal migration framework carried out in 2018. And we are very glad to have Monica Alfaro with us today. She works at the Legal Pathways and Integration Unit of the Director General for Migration and uh, Home Affairs at the European Commission in Brussels. She's been working for DG Home since the end of 2015 and her unit is responsible for legal migration and integration policies where she is the coordinator for the single permit directive and also part of the team responsible for the fitness check on legal migration legislation. Prior to joining DG Home, Monica worked in the European Commission on competition policy and social security coordination and before that, she worked in different law firms and the European Association representing community pharmacies. Monica has a law degree from the Central University of Barcelona. Uh, yesterday, as some of you might know, was the release of the new pact on migration and asylum. We will have a separate webinar on this in about a month, but I can already now say that the fitness check, which we will discuss today, also uh, fed into the process of uh, drafting this new pact on migration. And of course, the issue of legal pathways and legal migration are also one of the priorities mentioned in the new pact on migration and asylum, and therefore, I'm very glad that we will today receive an overview of the legal provisions at EU level and also the, the findings of this fitness check. With this being said, I would like to leave the floor to our speaker, Monica, and invite her to talk to us for about half of the envisaged time. And afterwards, we expect your questions to which she hopes to be able to answer. Uh, and uh, with this being said, I wish us all an interesting webinar. Thank you, Monica, for being with us. Um, thank you very much, Alexander. Um, good morning to all. I'm very happy to, to participate in this seminar today. 
I thank ICMPD for the invitation. In addition, this seminar comes at a very good time, just one day after the publication of the Factor Migration and Asylum, which uh, this will provide us with more elements for our discussion uh, today, and in particular about the next steps in, in the area of uh, um, legal migration. Um, so my area uh, of work, as mentioned by Alexander, is uh, legal migration, in particular labor migration. And uh, I would like to then focus my, my talk today on the EU framework for labor migration and uh, also the, briefly go through the results of the fitness check. Uh, that we did on this uh, framework. And I will also briefly mention uh, COVID-19 related challenges in this area. Um, okay, next slide, please. Yeah, but let me first start by briefly putting migration into, into to the EU, into context. There are currently about uh, 23 million third country nationals residing in the EU, which constitutes 4% um, of the total EU population. They uh, reside mainly in a few member states. And uh, in 2018, the main countries of origin were Ukraine, China, India, Syria, Belarus, and Morocco. Around 3 million first permits are issued every year by the EU member states for uh, um, legal migration purposes. So when we are talking about legal migrations uh, for today's presentation, I will refer mainly to uh, migration for work reasons, uh, family reunification, studies and research. But you see here uh, the main reasons to migrate, which are uh, first work, then family reunification, then studies, research, and finally international protection. However, the percentage of working migrants uh, in every member state is very diverse. For example, in Belgium, in, in 2017, only 11% of the migration population was uh, working. Uh, next slide, please. Turning now to, to the basis of the EU legal migration policy. Um, legal migration is a, uh, is a complex domain of shared competence uh, between the member states and the, and the EU. The EU doesn't force uh, the member states to admit uh, migrants or workers, but the treaty, uh, the treaty establishes that the member states uh, can determine the volumes of admission of third country nationals coming from third countries in the territory in order to seek work. Also in several instruments, including the, the blue card that we will uh, speak a, a bit later, uh, member states can apply labor market tests to ensure that the admission of migrants does not um, harm the local or sectoral uh, labor market. But uh, also the treaty uh, establishes that the EU shall develop a common immigration policy. And therefore the EU can adopt harmonizing legislation and it has done so as we will see on the conditions of entry and residence and the definition of rights of um, non-EU nationals residing in the in a member state, including the conditions for governing the free movement and residence in a second member state. Member states are also responsible for adopting integration measures, but the EU supports in investments of member states in this area through EU funding. Just to mention that the, this immigration, common immigration policy does not apply to the UK, of course, evidently, especially since uh, the end of this year, but it didn't apply before, as UK and Ireland have opted out for uh, the application of this chapter of the treaty, and, and Denmark is not subject to uh, a common immigration policy. All the rest of the member states uh, apply the measures adopted at EU level. Um, next slide, please. Um, I would like then to give you an overview of the existing legal migration directives that were developed um, 
as a result of these uh, treaty, treaty provisions. For the last uh, 15 years, the, the, the EU has developed this regulatory framework, a number of directives that uh, aim to facilitate the entry and residence of uh, migrants and to harmonize rules on admission condition procedures and a number of common rights. The EU measures cover the different uh, categories of, of uh, migrants that you see here, like long-term residents, highly qualified uh, employees with the blue card, um, seasonal workers, intra-corporate transferees, students, researchers, etc. There are also uh, rules for family reunification and the single application procedure uh, with a single permit. As you probably know, the EU original, uh, originally tried to uh, put forward uh, a, a single test to uh, regulate uh, migration, legal migration to the EU, something more like a, a migration code. However, the, the member states did not accept this, this approach and it was decide, decided to follow the sectoral approach. Um, through th these different categories of, of, of third country nationals. This has been uh, criticized, but um, the Commission uh, at least decided to have some sort of common rules um, through this way. And next slide, please. So what is covered by these directives? Mainly, they cover, as I have uh, mentioned, the, the admission conditions the, the, of a number of categories of third country nationals, um, workers, mainly students and researchers, harmonized procedures with uh, safeguard, safeguards, uh, harmonized safeguards for the procedures, such as deadline, um, possibilities of appeal for a rejection decision, etc and also uh, the format of the permit, equal treatment, access, access to work, and the right to family reunification and intra -e mobility. On intra -e mobility, I, I, just to mention that this, uh, the right provided in the directive is not the same as free movement right that uh, EU nationals enjoy because it's still subject to controls uh, and the issuance of new permits if the migrant wants to move to a second member state. So it's a more limited right. Uh, next slide, please. Um, however, on the contrary, uh, the directive established an extensive uh, ar um, harmonized rights based on equal treatment with EU nationals. As we will see later, uh, the equal team and provisions are one of the main added value of the EU legislation. Although some member states already had this kind of legislation in, in place, uh, others didn't, and some of them had to a different scope, different extent. So uh, it was important to introduce this harmonizing rights which certainly has increased the legal certainty for migrants. So the, legal, the single permit directive introduced already in 2011 a set of rights for uh, non-EU workers legally residing in, in one member state. Broad, broadly speaking, with some possibilities of restriction, migrant wo workers enjoy the, the, the equal treatment with EU nationals um, as regard the, this list, list of rights, working conditions, including pay, dismissal, health, safety at work, freedom of association, affiliation, education and, and vocational uh, training, the recognition of diplomas, very important uh, access to social security uh, benefits, uh, to a wide range of benefits like sickness, maternity, invalidity, all age pensions, survival pensions, accidents at work, death grants, unemployment, pre retirement and family benefits. There, are also, uh, there is also equal treatment regarding tax benefits, access to goods and services provided by the state and services from unemployment offices. 
um, there is a possibility to, to, to restrict some of these rights, especially for um, migrants that come for shorter periods of time. So member states can, for example, in the, in the case of seasonal workers, um, exclude them from unemployment and family benefits. Um, could, we, could we move to the next slide, please? Um, in during 2016-17, uh, we carried out an evaluation of this entire framework that you can see in the previous slides through a fitness check. A fitness check in the EU jargon is a retrospective analysis based on evaluation criteria set in the better regulation toolbox. The criteria are uh, relevance, coherence, effectiveness, efficiency, and added value. So on these criteria, we, we have analyzed the whole legislative framework. In particular, our objective was to evaluate possible uh, gaps and um, inconsistencies of the legal migration framework and try to develop a more comprehensive approach to contribute to the more effective management of migration flows. Regarding the legal scope, it's all the directives you, can, you have seen, uh, but some of the directives were uh, examined uh, more in depth because they have been implemented for a longer period of time. And the later ones, like, uh, like um, the, the seasonal workers, the uh, intercorporate transfer inside students and researchers, the, um, the analysis was less detailed. It, uh, the geographical scope was the 25 member states that applied the, the, the legislation uh, on, on legal migration. Next slide, please. Um, then um, the evaluation of the fitness chair has helped us to, um, to get an idea of the challenges that this framework is facing, as well as uh, where it can be improved. And also we identified the most efficient uh, aspects of the legislation. What were the challenges and lessons learned? First, we analyzed whether the, the initial objectives and the material scope, so uh, um, the, the subjects covered by this directive were still relevant. And we had many, many uh, consultation with the stakeholders, a public consultation, etc., meetings, uh, seminars, etc., And uh, all uh, stakeholders participated in, in this evaluation also agreed that these uh, objectives were still relevant and it was useful to have this legislative framework. However, uh, some categories of third country nationals uh, are not covered by the directive. We will look in, in, into this in the, ne in the next slides. Um, also, uh, we identified some internal coherence problems difference in the, the procedures, the deadlines, the, the, the application um, timings, etc., uh, the terminology, etc., which has had an impact on the performance of the legal framework as a whole. Regarding member states, the legislation was um, uh, generally well transposed. And uh, however, the legislation itself gives an ample discretion to member states. There are many, many um, optional clauses that the member states can adopt or not. And uh, this has had an impact on the effectiveness of the legislation and also uh, has led to practical problems for the, the migrants. Mm, next slide, please. We didn't identify uh, problems with uh, regarding the synergies and complementarity with other EU policies, such as uh, visa and border policies, employer sanctions, social security, um, employment, etc. And uh, as I have mentioned, a very important added value of the directives was the establishment of common admission conditions also the equal treatment uh, and the single application procedure and the procedure safeguards. 
All this uh, resulted in the rationalization of, of procedures at national level and also uh, increased legal certainty uh, overall. Uh, next slide, please. However, um, we identified important gaps in, in relation to the categories of, of migrants that are covered by the legislation. Um, at, by the legislation, um, the question is, should they be covered by EU legislation? The, the gaps were mainly self-employed that are excluded, uh, low and medium skill uh, economic migrants, the exception of seasonals that are only partly included in the single permit directive, job seekers, uh, international service providers, highly mobile uh, workers, investors, including the so-called golden visa, retired persons, issues related to regularization, and, and granted humanitarian permits. All these areas are not covered and we, 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 we should reflect whether they should be covered at, at EU level. Um, next slide, please. But beyond the, the challenges that were identified in the fitness check, that of course related mainly to the legislative framework, and going beyond the pandemic situation, because uh, the EU was already facing a number of challenges, I would like to, 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 to raise these challenges in the context of labour migration and also uh, the role labour migration can play in mitigating these challenges. Um, as we all know, in the long run, the EU is, uh, will face a decline of uh, working age population and skill shortages. The, the EU is aging and, and the positive net migration from third countries has already started uh, compensating for the declining of this working uh, age. And taking into account recent trends, the working age population uh, is predicted to de decline around 22 million, so a reduction of 7% in the next two decades. And in this slide, we see this a comparison of trends with a non-migration scenario. And we can see that the working age population decreases without migrants. And the ratio also between persons over 65 and the number of, of, of working age persons uh, increases without uh, migration. And next slide, please. <clears throat> also in, in recent surveys, 40% uh, of the employers um, report that in the EU report that they, they have encountered difficulties in finding employees with the right skills. And there are, uh, in many sectors, important labor shortages in the ICT uh, sector, healthcare sector, uh, especially highlighted now with the COVID pandemic, science, engineering, et cetera. Therefore, um, migration and, and effective integration of uh, legally residing migrants can contribute to, to the competitiveness of the EU economy, and it's very important for that. But there is a need to attract EU level uh, workers with the right skills. And for this, we are in competition with other uh, uh, regions in the EU or the, in countries, countries in, in the world like uh, Canada and US. And next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, I think there is one before, before this. Yeah. Um, I would like just to mention uh, briefly, um, COVID-19 related challenges uh, in, in this area of, of, of legal migration. Uh, COVID-19, and as we all know, is, is having an unprecedented impact on, on global economies, businesses and, and workers. According to the ILO, uh, 
full or partial uh, lockdown measures are affecting uh, nearly um, 2. billion workers, representing 81% uh, of the global workforce. And uh, migrants have been uh, particularly affected uh, by the pandemic. Um, in the area of uh, legal migration, new challenges uh, have emerged, as for example, the, uh, the situation where migrants get stuck in one member state and the permit has expired. Um, for this, uh, member states took from, from March 2020 pragmatic decisions and granted extensions of stay to, to, to migrants in this situation special certificate COVID uh, extensions and in order to give these measures um, a Schengen-wide effect and to avoid problems with the migrants go from one member state or another one or they want to reapply for a permit, um, the member states notified to the, the Commission these this, uh, temporary extensions and they have been uh, compiled and published in a new Annex 21 uh, 41 to the Schengen, Schengen uh, Handbook of Bodegas and uh, Annex 2A of the Visa Handbook. Uh, also, uh, COVID has had a very uh, important impact on, on migration flows in general. Um, mobility of migrants has have been largely suspended and entry bans were introduced by, by member states. In this respect, the Council adopted in, in June uh, 2020, a recommendation on the gradual lifting of this um, temporary restriction uh, of non-essential uh, travel to the EU. And this, the, this restriction should be lifted um, uh, for the countries that are uh, in the uh, annex of the recommendation. For the moment, 50 countries, but this uh, list is revised uh, every, every two weeks. It's important to note that um, this recommendation is not legally binding for the member states and uh, the public health related restrictions are adopted by member states under, under national law. Other issues uh, related to the COVID pandemic has, uh, have uh, required uh, reflection and attention and these uh, are, uh, for example, the deterioration of the social and economic conditions of migrants due to the, due to the economic recession. Um, this has had an impact on the fulfillment of some of the conditions to uh, acquire different status or permits, for example, the income criteria. Um, also, there has been delays in the issuance of new documents, permits, residence permits, etc. And uh, in, the, in, in relation to, to, to initiatives launched by the Commission, for example, the Labour Migration Pilot Projects that was launched in 2018 uh, for member states that uh, offer uh, um, labor positions to, to, to migrants coming from third countries, which the, the, the Commission is providing support, financial support. We have had already six projects ongoing and all of them have been affected by the COVID-19 uh, situation and uh, they have been delayed and also the mobility that was envisaged <clears throat> has been suspended in, in some cases. But which lessons ha has we, have we learned from this, this situation? I have to highlight that we have had some positive lessons. Um, the emergency situation um, stimulated the, the creativity and so many bureaucracies uh, reacted in, in, in a more uh, flexible and pragmatic way, which is a, a very good thing and hopefully it will stay. Also, um, the important role of migrants and session workers during the, this crisis has helped to create uh, a more uh, positive attitude towards migrants in the EU. And uh, the emerging situation forced authorities to, to, to promote or use more uh, e-communication in documents. And we hope this, this, this trend will stay and uh, 
hygiene and health uh, incidents leading to, to, to COVID outbreak has raised the public uh, and uh, political attention to the situation of uh, migrants in some, some, some places and uh, the need to a good, good enforcement of the rights, for example, in terms of uh, dignified working conditions, uh, proper accommodation, etc. And next slide, please. But uh, I would like to then conclude uh, my presentation, touching upon the follow-up of the fitness check and, and uh, the measures announced yesterday uh, in the context of the new pact on migration and, and asylum. The fitness check, as we have seen, uh, identifies several uh, effect, positive effects, as well as a number of critical issues that need to be addressed. And some of these issues um, are now part of the next uh, steps outlined by the Commission in the pact, in the pact communication. As I mentioned, um, the, the EU needs a more uh, harmonized and effective approach to uh, attracting highly skilled workers. For this, the Commission uh, will relaunch or has announces the, the, the relaunch of the negotiations on the revised blue card that aim at imp improving the scheme, the EU scheme at EU level and um, facilitated the access of migrants to this scheme. So this, uh, the communication calls for uh, the Council and the Parliament to, to retake the negotiations of this directive and to quickly uh, fi finalize the, the negotiations. Also, we need an enforce, uh, uh, stronger enforcement of the directives at national level improve the information on legal pathways because we have uh, observed that um, many of the consulates from member states around the world they, they provide uh, fair information on the national uh, schemes to to move to the member states but there is not sufficient information about the um, legal pathways uh, at EU level. So the schemes uh, harmonize at EU level. And there is a need to promote and increase this information. Also, there is a need to improve the gathering of data and uh, improve also the, the information sharing between member states, especially in intra EU mobility. In order to, to tackle the inconsistencies and gaps that we have discussed in, in the previous slides, and under this overall objective to attract the talent uh, to the EU that the EU needs, the Commission has, has announced um, the launch of a debate on next steps on legal migration through a consultation that has been already launched um, yesterday. And uh, is proposing to, to put forward a skill uh, and talent packaging, including the revision of the long-term directive the long-term residence directive and the single permit directives. Also, we will explore the, the possibility of developing a EU talent pool uh, for uh, skilled workers coming from, from outside the EU, which could operate at a, as a white, uh, EU-wide platform for international recruitment, where um, migrants could register the interest of uh, coming to work to the, the EU and uh, they will be part of a database that can be uh, where the employers, authorities can search. And, and finally, building on the experience of the pilot projects on legal migration that, that I have mentioned, the Commission will, will launch the talent partnerships with key non uh, EU countries that will uh, aim to match labor and skills needs in the EU. So this talent partnership will provide the EU framework for funding to support legal migration and mobility from key countries. And we aim at launching this uh, with the EU neighborhood and um, also, we need a strong engagement from our member states. Our member states are ultimately responsible for, for the labor migrants they, they admit 
and we need to work very closely with the private sector as well. The, the Italian partnerships will be launched uh, at a high level conference with member states at uh, a key stakeholder, but there is no uh, date uh, scheduled yet. Um, all these measures uh, confirm that uh, legal migration and in particular labor migration are very high in the EU political agenda and they will continue to play a key, a key role uh, in the, under the pact. I will uh, conclude here, and, but uh, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I look forward to uh, the question, your questions and the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monica. It's been a very interesting presentation, very comprehensive. Thanks a lot for that. And I would like to maybe give our participants some time to ask more questions through the chat. You can do so either in English or in Russian. And I already see a first question from our uh, colleague uh, in the MPF team, namely whether DG Home is in the lead or coordinating the talent partnerships. Well, the talent partnership is a, a very, uh, a very um, initial idea so all the details and how the coordination is going to take place among the different DGs who will take the lead um, will have to be decided uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the months to come so in the days to come so it is it is not yet decided Thank you. While we await uh, additional questions, and I again invite all participants to please uh, ask either in Russian or English, let me maybe um, also react to your presentation by saying that the Prague process is currently funded under the Mobility Partnership Facility, which of course uh, is a program financed by DG Holmes or your uh, own uh, Director General. And uh, we do the dialogue within the Prague process and of course the uh, mobility uh, partnership facility provides for funding uh, for EU member states to apply for concrete initiatives with partner countries and uh, their labor migration is of course also one of the priorities and they have also launched this pilot projects on labor migration with key countries. But I would like to ask particularly about the Prague process region. Um, what is your assessment of what, how we could contribute as a dialogue maybe to better informing our states? This webinar, of course, is part of our efforts to share information between the EU and non-EU countries. Uh, among our listeners, we have a lot of EU member states, but also non-EU countries represented by their responsible migration agencies. So what is your expectation or um, requirement also as uh, the institution funding the Prague process to improve the cooperation with our partner countries to facilitate the future ambitions of the commission and maybe also to, uh, to, to, to make a better link between EU member states and partner countries. Your advice would be most helpful. Thank you for, for the question, Alexander. Yes, the Prague uh, process dialogue, I, I think, can play a key role in this post uh, PAC phase. It is a very useful tool for, for cooperation and the one that uh, um, also one of the uh, main cooperation areas in, in, within the, the Prague process remit is uh, legal migration and labor migration in particular. Um, the countries in the PRAC process are uh, key partners for the EU, particularly the Eastern Partnership countries and also the Western Balkans. And you can see that uh, there is um, uh, in the pact itself uh, a reference uh, 
of uh, in the Italian partnership to 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 launch first uh, the the initiative with the with the uh, neighborhood countries and the, the Western Balkan countries, etc. So uh, it's going to be a, a very important framework for discussion, for cooperation, and uh, for uh, work towards the objective of um, boosting the international mobility, in my view. Thank you. We will certainly try our best and we'll be in touch also with the Commission. And now I leave uh, the floor to Irina for the questions. Well, we only got one question so far, so I invite actively our participants, our listeners to address their spheres of their interest right now. That's a wonderful opportunity for you to got your questions replied, answered by the Commission also. So one of the first questions that's, could you provide more details about the EU talent pool? Elaborate a little bit on that. Um, yes, um, you know that uh, some, some time ago, we uh, worked with the OECD to, to do a study to uh, examine how other uh, uh, systems or um, um, entry systems work in, in, in other ge geographical areas in the world, for example, in, in Australia, in Canada, etc., where there is these point systems, etc. Um, we wanted to see whether this uh, kind of system would be feasible in, uh, at EU level, bearing in mind that we have all the member states. And um, there were some, some recommendations by the, uh, the OECD. It would be a, a very effective way of uh, promoting the mobility of, of third country workers and matching the skills with the real shortages. There is not at the moment at EU level an effective uh, way to do, to do this. Uh, and uh, therefore, the idea will be to explore how this kind of uh, platform can be created at your level. Um, we will probably uh, uh, launch some study or uh, feasibility research to see how uh, such a, a recruitment platform could be, could be organized at your level. Okay, that's basically the reply. So the idea is there, but the work is still ahead, right? Yes, yes. Okay, I think that's very demanded. Also, in terms of what you mentioned with regard to the database that is also planned to be developed in terms of the vacancies, in terms of all their yeah. tools. So I wonder to what extent this database will be accessible in the national languages, because that's the most usual request that our partner countries get. Yeah, this, this, uh, this database uh, is, is part of the will be part of this platform. So it's the same, the it's same the project. Same. Yeah, it's the same project. Um, and uh, therefore the, 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 the way forward is to explore also technically uh, uh, which languages, uh, data protection, many issues around the, 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 this type of platform that are still um, unknown. And we will have to work towards uh, finding uh, the, the responses to all this and how can be uh, set up uh, a U level for, for, for being a, a useful tool um, that can be used by the member states directly and uh, where they can find uh, the, the, the candidates, but also which member states they will go. Uh, this is, will be central uh, um, platform or not, there, there are still quite a few, a few open issues. Okay, details are yet to be known. Um, so, questions arrived. Finally, thank you participants, thank you listeners for finally addressing a few questions. Um, is the Commission also looking at development a skills forecasting system, allowing to anticipate the needs of the private sector? Is the Commission still participating to develop a certain skills forecasting system in terms of anticipating, predicting what yes. the private sector needs are? Yeah. 
there are some tools now that the FOB ETF that help us to, 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 to have information on, on the skill shortages, they're quite valid uh, tools. Um, however, yes, we would like to develop this, uh, this skill forecast and uh, whether it could be integrated in this, this uh, pool uh, initiative or not is also to be discussed, but it is something that we, we are reflecting upon. Okay, so um, as opposed to the basically uh, reactive approach as it's done right now, the needs are basically identified when uh, there is certain demand on the market and it's not researched that well. Okay, the question from Alex, um, what about the timeline for revising the mentioned EU directives? The, the timeline will be um, uh, 2021. Hopefully. Okay. So, so it should be, should be ready by, by the end of next year. And when do you expect to apply the new rules after the after? revision? Um, Basically, as of that should be about three years, you know, okay. for implementation, transposition. Yeah. Okay. Should be about three years after, after that. Yeah. Two or three years, if there is agreement at the Council, of course. Yeah. We, we will only make the, the proposals, but then once the, 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 the revised texts are adopted, then you, you normally it's two years, two or three years. Two or three years, so by 2025, hopefully. Somewhere yeah. there. Um, Somewhere there. Can, can you explain the differences or similarities between the talent partnership and the pilot projects? Yes. Um, the pilot projects uh, was an initiative uh, launched by the Commission at the end of 2017. And uh, the, the funding came basically from uh, the Digicom funds. And uh, we were quite successful because we had uh, several applications um, from member states. For, for all this, of course, we have worked with ICMPD, also worked very hard in, in, in dealing with uh, potential um, applicants, etc. But uh, to be an initial uh, initiative, you know, we, we have had a quite a good response by member states and, 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 and private sector. So we have a few projects ongoing. Given that this has worked quite quite well, the idea would be now to upscale the the, the this kind of a structured project, but uh, increase uh, the funding and uh, try to channel all the different uh, sources of funding that there are at different uh, directory generals in the in the commission for labor migration and into a, a one single framework. And uh, then have a more cohesive and coordinated approach to, to the funding for, uh, for uh, labor migration projects. Of course, as with the pilot projects, we will have to work closely with the member states that will event uh, eventually be the ones that will have to determine what needs they have and uh, also the, the private sector. But the idea is to develop this, uh, this uh, structure and uh, way of functioning of the pilot project into, into a larger projects, maybe with more uh, beneficiaries. Okay, so basically upscaling and uh, upscaling working, the, working with their, what has been done already with regard to the pilot projects and doing yes, this on the next yes, level. Yes, w working with the private sector and uh, member states in order for them to uh, uh, determine which needs they have and then we can uh, be ready to, to, to fund certain specific projects of, of labor mobility also could be also a training and um, reintegration back in the in the country of origin or uh, capacity building etc the different areas that were covered by the pilot project okay thank you very much thank you for your reply so the next question would be very specific um in the framework of the coronavirus of the comet 
pandemic. Are there any other written documents, except for the Annex 41 of the Schengen Handbook, that are related to regulating the stay of foreigners that are remaining in their member states? Is there any additional document that regulates their stay? The people who are stuck, who are left in their countries, they couldn't leave because of the pandemic situation. Is there anything written? As far Apart as I know, mm -hmm. there are some guidance for uh, the, 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 the situation of seasonal workers and uh, other categories that, are, that have been published by the Commission. So, but I don't think there is anything uh, on paper regulating the situation, apart from the application of the uh, legislative framework that already exists, that it should be applied the same, whether in the COVID situation or, or not. So the same uh, equal treatment provisions are uh, enforced and are there to guarantee that, uh, for example, in terms of unemployment, in terms of, of social security, all these rights are not uh, reduced because of the, of the COVID uh, situation. We, we are aware, of course, that the, the, the difficulties, the recession, there will be maybe problems uh, regarding this, but uh, there is an obligation for member states to maintain these, these, these uh, measures in place. Okay, thank you very much. That's quite clear. Many countries addressed it separately, individually, in their own way, extended the stay, and we also seen it around the EU, how member states did it. Um, the next question coming from Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer, for your question. How are, are the key countries going to be defined? Will it be the countries with the formal agreements that they have the formal agreements with the EU or EU member states such as the mobility partnership or the focus will be on countries of origin or countries of transit? Um, I would say that there will be uh, a priority for neighborhood countries, Eastern Partnership and, and, and Western Balkans and also Northern African countries in, in, in general. Countries okay. with there are there is a, already uh, 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 either mobility partnerships or uh, a dialogue in place or, or uh, special relations with them, but uh, nothing is is predefined at the moment. So the discussions are still to follow to define. Yes, the, yes, yes. yes and it can. They're 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 regular suspects. The yes, <laughs> and the priorities can change over, over, over time regarding which key third countries no, are, are of interest also, uh, not only from the EU side, but from the third country side. Okay, thank you very much. So now we have a question also from Olga about the mechanisms proposed by a new pact. The pact was just released, but hopefully maybe you know already some details. The mechanisms proposed by the new pact um, to protect the rights of newcomers. We know that you're not an asylum seeker expert and not uh, an, an expert on international protection, but um, what about the new tailored mechanisms to share migratory border in the EU? And what about the mechanisms to pr protect the fundamental rights of asylum seekers? Would you know anything on that? Or should we rather keep this question for, for, for the other webinar? Well, I th I think that um, it's a good uh, good idea. It would be a good idea to, to, to deal with these issues on on, on uh, as asylum uh, matters in the in the webinar that you are going to, to have uh, in a, in about a month. These are very complex issues, um, as the pack was just released yesterday. We didn't have much time to read it. Um, I, I shared the, the the concerns. Yes, we we, we have to to. It's not my area of work, so I would need to read it uh, as, as, as much as you to, to, to understand. Uh, so I cannot tell you very much. Um, but um, yeah, I, I would prefer to, 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 to leave it like that and, 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 and as an issue to, to discuss later with, with more information. Exactly. Just a little announcement for our listeners. In about a month, we'll have a webinar that would be devoted specifically to the new migration pact. So there will be all the questions. You can gather them and they will be replied. They will be answered then. Um, 
Daphne is asking about the, um, could you clarify whether the Commission will table a new proposal for a new fund on labour migration? I, I, um, will there be a new proposal for a new fund for labour migration that Commission can actually outline? Yeah, at this stage, I, I, I don't think the, 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 there is a a reflection on a specific fund in labor migration. The, the labor migration is funded through different uh, sources. Uh, some of them are uh, in the context of uh, DEFCO funds, then the engineer, depending on the geographical areas of the country. So there are many different factors that uh, define which funds are used uh, for labor, labor migration and uh, especially the geographical uh, location of the countries. So, uh, as far as I know, there is no uh, reflection on a single, single fund. Okay, so it will be diverse base of sourcing yeah. labor migration, different activities and measures. Okay, thank you very much, Monica. Then um, another question we have with regard to the six countries. During your presentation, you mentioned that EU was facilitating labor migration schemes with six countries, and this was suspended due to the COVID restrictions. Could you list which are those countries and in which fields were chosen for the job deployment? Which were the areas for the jobs? They're, they're, yeah. The recruiting yeah, areas. yeah. We 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 have uh, several ongoing projects, and uh, that been uh, the the projects have been proposed by um, Belgium, Spain, Lithuania, uh, France, and Germany, uh, mainly, and they are uh, they cover. Um, uh, migrants from uh, Senegal and um, Morocco and Tunisia and uh, Egypt and also Nigeria. So these uh, are the, the six projects. Their areas are very varied. For example, um, Belgium and, and uh, Lithuania are uh, have planned the mobility for uh, IT experts. So there is a, a, a strong focus in engineering IT expertise. And uh, the uh, beneficiaries of these uh, projects um, have partly moved to the, to the, to the country's uh, destination, but uh, not with the same uh, rapidity that was foreseen. So only some have moved, some of them are still uh, waiting in the countries of origin. They are doing uh, trainings, they are doing uh, pre-departure uh, formation and uh, language training. So uh, they are, the, the projects are still, still ongoing. Uh, the Spanish project, for example, uh, was to bring a hundred uh, uh, Moroccan students, um, university students, to do master degrees in, in Spain. Uh, in a number of uh, matters that were criticized and agreed with Mar Moroccan authorities beforehand. All these students uh, have moved to, to Spain now. But unfortunately, they have to follow the, 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 the classes online, which has uh, been a pity because it yeah, has coincided with the situation. The, 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 the aim was that they will integrate with, uh, with the, the other students, that they will have a more practical experience. And unfortunately, they are uh, doing the classes online. The French uh, project um, was to bring uh, stagiaires or trainees to do a special uh, uh, stash in the in the in certain companies. This project uh, has been, um, to my knowledge, uh, stopped but because there, there was a lot of reluctance by the private companies in the situation to to employ the the the. the the beneficiaries. So, for the moment, only some of them have uh, have uh, moved, 
and uh, the, 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 the Belgian project, yes, is going ahead, ahead, but some of them have moved, other ones are still waiting, the same as the Lithuanian. So there has been um, some, some, some impact on, 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 the, on the projects uh, or the time, time span as foreseen, but they haven't been suspended basically, so they will continue. They will continue. So basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. just be in a certain delay in implementation, but um, yeah, many yeah. projects will go ahead. Um, yeah. I have a question with regard to that, that you mentioned that these students who came to Spain, is there any plan within this project, maybe you know, to then recruit them to facilitate their further recruitment into the labor integration into the local labor market in Spain? The, the objective of this project concretely was not to, to recruit, recruit them in the, in the national labor market, but it has a, a component of reintegration in the country of origin, uh, which uh, is based for, uh, basically on um, those who will uh, present a special uh, plan or a project post max, end of master project with uh, a, a startup or business idea, um, they will receive uh, an additional funding to develop this in the, in the, in the country of, of origin. And also the, the, there will be uh, support for, for the candidates to integrate into the, the Moroccan labor market in, in cooperation with uh, chambers of commerce there and etc. So that was mainly the, the, the idea for this project, to uh, try to, 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 to integrate uh, the workers with the knowledge acquired in the masters in Spain, in the, in the, in the labor markets in, in Morocco. Okay, thank you, thank you. Pretty, pretty interesting idea also for, for, for the countries of origin themselves, I think. Yes. Um, Alex is asking about the role of the circle migration in the future. Can you tell us anything about that? What yeah. role would you see for, for this scheme? C circular migration, I think, is a, a, a very important uh, type of migration for the future. That has to be uh, promoted and it will be promoted by the Commission. There is already some, some um, uh, legislation that supports and, and, and promotes uh, circular migration, for example, uh, already in, in place, the seasonals directive that uh, has provision facilitating the re-entry of, of the workers in successive years. And uh, it's going to be a, a very important part of the uh, overall uh, labor migration approach to, 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 to mobility of workers. It's uh, beneficial for, for the countries of destinations, for the countries of origin. So I, I, I firmly believe that there is a lot of future in, 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 in circular migration. And a follow-up question to that, that I have also in mind. Do you think there, there would be a coherent approach in terms of the social security that goes along with migration and circular migration in particular? Do you think there might be a coherent approach on the EU level to that? Because that's the usual comment that we get from the third countries from our partner states and they are always interested whether this is addressed by by their destination countries by the eu countries yeah um hopefully yes they the, there is uh, as as i mentioned in in my presentation the equal uh, treatment provisions in the in the current framework um which uh, provide for this equal treatment uh, for all uh, legally residing migrants that are working or have the right to work. And uh, they are entitled uh, in terms of social security to the same benefits as uh, uh, EU nationals. However, there is no, um, no um, um, let's say, uh, export possibilities of these this, uh, benefits only for pensions. And uh, so uh, pensions, uh, once the person, the third country national wants to go back to the, the country of origin, can then be paid the pension 
in the country of origin and the same, under the same conditions and rights as uh, EU nationals. Um, the, the, the other uh, benefits like healthcare or family benefits and so on will depend on bilateral agreements with the, between the third country and the, and the member states individually. So for the moment, this is the way it's, 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 it's done because uh, also social security is, is a national competence and only the coordination is done, the coordination for the benefits when there is movement uh, of uh, citizens in between the EU, it's done by the, at EU level. So we may hope for some um, bilateral solutions between certain countries also in this. Certainly, yeah. Maybe not a coherent approach, but at least yeah. some individual solutions. Thank you very much for your reply. I think we're done with the questions. I don't see any other ones. So I would welcome Alexander to return back to the screen and I would still welcome our participants to drop us a few extra questions if they have them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for going through the question and answer session. We still have some time, but of course we don't have to uh, wait until 12 o'clock to finish this webinar. I will use this time now to announce already the next webinars. In about two weeks, uh, we will have a webinar on building better return and reintegration policies with a former colleague of ours who is now an independent advisor uh, from Australia, Glenn Swan. So we will have his webinar on 6th of October and we have already uh, sent out the invitation yesterday. And then next we shall have the webinar on the new pact on migration and asylum uh, in about a month on 22nd of October. Until then, we will also see the reactions of the member states and uh, the different analysts and experts of how they perceive the new migration pact and what it shall bring to the EU, but also partner countries. I was uh, very happy to read already on the first page of the new migration pact that partnerships with non-EU countries and dialogue with uh, partners is uh, underlined as uh, specifically important. So the Prague process will try to organize uh, different uh, activities, be it publications or webinars on the various aspects of the new migration pact. I think today we already had the pleasure to learn a lot on the legal migration field and uh, there is also a lot coming up as we heard with several directives uh, to be revised and with the migration pact also launching new ideas such as the talent partnerships. So we will certainly contribute to passing the message to our participating states. And I would like to thank you, Monica, for all the efforts to answer to the questions and for providing such a comprehensive overview of the policies that we have in place. It was a pleasure and it was specifically also challenging for you because you had to step in instead of a colleague. So thank you for accepting this invitation and for being with us and I hope that we will be in touch uh, both in terms of uh, future cooperation within the Prague process, but also within the mobility partnership facility more generally. Um, and with this being said, maybe you have uh, some final words to all participants uh, or the secretary. No, just to say thank you very much for, for, for the invitation. It has been a, a pleasure for me also to, to be here today. And I have found very interesting the questions and, and, and the discussion. Thank you. We will actually now ask our dear participants to fill out a short survey uh, or evaluation form on how they found the webinar. So please take a minute or two to fill out, uh, to provide your answers to the few questions on how you like this webinar. It will help us a lot in improving in the future. Uh, and I think the questions will be displayed now. Here they are. Yes, so we hope to meet again. And I would also take this opportunity to already inform you now about the Prague Process Senior Officials Meeting, which will take place on 16th of November in an also online format. Uh, the Senior Officials Meeting of the Prague Process will allow us to reassess the thematic priorities of our participating states. We have sent out a questionnaire to all states to 
choose which uh, thematic areas and also sub areas they are most interested in. And we will then also discuss uh, the COVID-19 situation and its impacts on migration overall, but also present the, the future work plan for next year, where we will try to, of course, accommodate the priorities listed by our states. And uh, the, the senior officials meeting, of course, will provide all states with an opportunity to intervene and also report from their countries on their priorities and needs. So we are very much looking forward to this annual event, which shall then also pave the way to the next ministerial conference of the Prague process, which is envisaged for 2022. I wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you, Monica, once again. Thanks for the interpreters and the technical assistance and, of course, uh, to my team for supporting this event. And uh, I wish you all a great evening or afternoon, depending on where you are, and see you soon again. Goodbye.